Today's stuff we're going to be learning is Nidarim Daf Nun Aleph. Today's stuff is sponsored by Margot Kasaf Shizga in honor of the Aliyah of her parents, Sinclair and Helen Kasaf. Mazal Tov. Okay, we're going to get started with our fascinating in, uh, beginning of the Daf. Lots of, I would say, kind of crazy stories. Hard to understand what exactly is going on and how this happened and what the message is, but we will think about it and try to come up with some theories. So we started with, let's just go back to what we're in the middle of. We got into this because we're talking about the Beitza Tortima and how that's not included in the general term of a Tavshil. Okay, and then we heard from Shmuel that it's a very unique dish that only certain people know how to use. Then we had this person who hired someone to teach his slave how to make a thousand different methods of some other dish because we're talking about, seems like we're talking about wealth and unique dishes. And he gets upset because the person only taught him 800 types and he takes him to court in front of Rebbe. And Rebbe says, what kind of craziness is this? Like, this is real opulence. Now, it's kind of ironic that Rebbe's the one saying this because Rebbe is sitting in the Beit HaNasi. He is the, you know, the wealthy one of the generation. He has all these relationships with the Romans. And it, it the story comes up in the light of, you know, right at the end of this thing where he says, Avotenu amru nashinu tova. Our father said, wow, we used to have good and no, we don't have it anymore. What he's talking about in the destruction that we don't remember anymore, you know, how good things were, how prosperous things were. And maybe this is a little bit of a critique on him. What do you mean? This isn't like, you don't know opulence. You know, you don't know wealth. And we get into this story. So the first story we already saw, which is that Rebbe doesn't invite Bar Kapara to his son's wedding. And Bar Kapara gets very upset. Either he writes it on the wall or someone else writes it on the wall. All this money spent on the wedding and you can't invite Bar Kapara. And then Bar Kapara has this line, you know, if this is what God does to people who don't do his will, you know, all the more so what God must do to people who do their will, meaning if you have so much wealth. You know, some people say it actually means all the people who got invited to the wedding who weren't great people and look, they're getting rewarded by getting to the wedding. Think about all the people who are good people who didn't get invited to a wedding like me, right? How much I should be rewarded. Then in the end, Rebbe invites him and then Bar Kapara kind of switches his line and says, well, if people who you know get rewarded in this world, think about how much more they're going to get rewarded in the next world. Then we start with uh, our story for today. Yoma were three lines from the bottom of Nun Amubet. Yes, and it does echo of the Kamsa Bar Kamsa story. I also thought it was interesting because he's Bar Kapara, like Bar Kamsa. It definitely sounds like that. And um, another thing, I just want to tell you what his real name is. His real, his full name is Rabbi Elazara Kapal. Okay, but notice in the Bible, he's called Bar in in our study, he's called Bar Kapara. He loses his Rebbe term. We're going to talk about this later. Yoma de Machaye. This is, seems like possibly this is giving background to the situation. Yoma de Mechayech be Rebbe, at ye puranutal alma. Day that Rebbe smiles will bring calamity to the world. Okay, and maybe this is what's going on here because we're going to find out that Bar Kapara had a good sense of humor or he was like, you know, somebody would call him the jester. He was the guy who liked to poke fun and, and laugh, get people to laugh. And maybe that's why Rebbe didn't want to invite him to the wedding. This is possible. It's not clear, but it's possible. Now, what does this have to do? Why is it bad if Rebbe laughs or smiles? So, there's different interpretations. Some people say, and it's harder for me to accept this, this approach, that um, it sounds a little bit Christian, that Rebbe kind of bore the iniquities of the people. And because of that, he had to kind of be suffering, and that actually was good for the people. And as soon as he would smile, it would be bad for the people. Um, it's possible that that's an approach. There's another approach, though, which I think is a more realistic approach, which is he was the leader, and he needed to be serious all the time. In other words, if he got distracted from thinking about the people by smiling and, you know, being happy, it could theoretically, you know, if something important comes up and he's too busy enjoying himself, then it would cause calamity to the Jewish people. So because of his responsibility, like he burdened, you know, a huge amount of responsibility on his shoulders, he needed to be serious. So therefore, Amr Leila Bar Kapara, he says to Bar Kapara, now it's unclear whether all these stories happened at the same time. I'm going to assume that they did. Once he invited Bar Kapara to the wedding, he said to him, and especially at a wedding, you know, that's what you do. You try to make people smile and laugh and have a good time. Don't make me laugh. And if you do, if you keep to your word, I will give you 40 measures of wheat. Okay, he's promising him 
money. It was interesting that he's promising him financial, not money, but you know, something of the value of money. I think it's interesting in the story that he's promising him a monetary reward for keeping to his word. When Bar Kapar is a little bit against this opulence and wealth of Rebbe. You know, it's, it's like if you think someone's so wealthy and you're against their use of wealth, you know, as he said, you, you invited all, you, know, you spent X amount of money on your wedding and you didn't invite me. And he, he seems to be, and I think the story is a lot, uh, Bar Kapar has a lot of issues with Rebbe and his position as, as the leader. And when you're the person who's, who's accused of using your wealth in a bad way, and then you promise someone will keep to this and I'll give you money, it's a bit of a slap in the face. And I think that's why the story goes as it goes. I think he was upset with the fact that Rebbe promised him this money, you know, using your money to bribe me, but not exactly bribe. And as Rebbe wasn't bribing him, but from Bar Kapara's eyes, it was a little bit like you're paying me off, you know, and he didn't like that. So what happens? Amarle, let's say Mari, the whole grieving to be in a Shakilna. A bit of a strange line, what he means by this, I'm not exactly sure, but he says, you're going to see, I'm going to take every grieve of wheat that I want. In other words, it doesn't matter what you promise me, okay? I'm deserving of more, maybe, less, you know, I'm the one who, call, and maybe what he's saying is, I'm the one who calls the shots and not you. Shakel di Kula Rabba, he takes a big, huge basket, Chafye Kufra, he covers it with with tar to basically make sure it covers the bottom so that nothing falls out because you, know, you get wheat, it's going to all fall through the holes. Okay, stuff, a bunch of different interpretations of what this means. Either he turns it on its head and just turns the basket upside down. That is, first, he puts the tar in to make it look like I'm going to go collect from you. Then he turns it upside down or he turns it upside down on his head, Okay, which either is covering himself or you know, saying again, I don't want your, I don't want your wheat. Okay, I'm not interested in it. And he says to him, you know, go give me the 40 grievechite that you promised me with this upside down basket. Obviously saying, thanks, but no thanks. Now, Rebbe laughed at this. Okay, he laughed at it. Why? Because the whole thing was a little bit ridiculous, you know, and, and maybe this thing sticking it on his head just looked funny. And it made Rebbe laugh, which was the whole point. He wasn't supposed to make Rebbe laugh. Didn't I tell you not to make me laugh? Now, first of all, when Bar comes with it upside down, maybe what he's saying is, I'm going to make you laugh and I'm not going to collect my money because, you know, my wheat, because there, there's no way I'm not making you laugh. Like, this is what I do. And, you know, give me what I'm deserving of, which is nothing because I'm going to make you laugh. And in fact, he does make him laugh. And he says, didn't I warn you not to make me laugh? And he gets upset at him. I was just trying to collect the, the wheat that I was deserving of, okay? which isn't really a good answer, right? Um, it's again, he's kind of pushing him off. Now, I want to point out one word that seems to appear here a few times. The grieve chite de rashina bach. Okay, rashina and reshe are very similar, right? Reshe is his head. He puts it upside down on his head or he turns it on its head, the, the, the um, basket. And then he says, you know, Rashina is what, what I am demanding of you, but it also seems to ha you, he's using a weird word. He could have used many other words to say that. And maybe what he's trying to say is, and maybe particularly when he flips the basket on his head or on its head, he's trying to show, I want to flip you from your head. You're the head. You think you're the head. You, you know, you act like the head but you're doing a lot of things wrong. And maybe he's symbolically showing I should be in charge. You know, maybe he's saying I'm getting what I deserve. You know, maybe he's saying I should be in charge. And I think the flipping on its head is kind of saying, you know, he, he fitted it with tars if it's all ready. And then he flips it on its head. And I think he's trying to send a message to Rebbe that you really aren't doing well as a leader and you have a lot of issues you have to deal with. So next, now some people claim that Bar Kapara came with, okay, the question is what's going on here? And we're going to see the story gets worse and worse. If you think this was bad, it's going to get way worse. And what was Bar Kapara doing? And how could Bar Kapara have acted like this? And some people say he had really good motives in mind. And what he really thought is some people think he was against this whole approach of the, of the Nasi of being serious and that you can rule better if you're happy, if you're in a good frame of mind, right? There's a definitely theory for saying that, right? You shouldn't be uh, you know, serious all the time. It's good to be in a good mood and that helps you. 
I like in the way the Nevi'im used to bring people to, to play musical instruments for them, to be in a good frame of mind to rule the people. And maybe he was he was doing this as against, you know, the, the type of rule that Rebbe had. And maybe, you know, maybe that was a good thing. Or maybe he's coming to critique, as we said, the opulence and the wealth and that, that he had a good legitimate claim. On the other hand, the way he does it is incredibly disrespectful. And it's hard to really look at Bar Kapara, the, the commentaries, try to support him and try to explain how he did this. But honestly, in the simple reading, he's really not viewed as a very good character here. And even if he has some critique, there's a way to do it and there's a way to do it. So it almost sounds a little bit like the like the Korach story, right? Coming against like, who made you leader and, and why are you doing this? So Amrle Bar Kapara the Barte de Rebbe. Now he goes over to the daughter of Rebbe, who we'll see in a minute is married. Okay, so not exactly the most appropriate thing. He goes over to the daughter of Rebbe. Tomorrow I'm going to drink wine. When your father is dancing and your mother's singing. A bit of a strange line. It's almost like a pickup line, you know, but she's married and it's it's not exactly very appropriate. And you'll see it gets even worse. Ben Elasa. Now we get the name of her husband. Ben Elasa Chatzne de Rebbe Hava. He was the son-in-law of Rebbe. Va'ashir Gadol Hava. Okay, he was known for his wealth. He was not known for his lamdanut, his learned. He was not a learned person. He happened to be a wealthy person. So put him out of your mind for a minute. We're only going to get back to him at the end of the story. Now what happens? Azmane lebehi lula de Rabbi Shimon Berebi. So now he gets invited to this party for Rabbi Shimon Berebi. This seems like Lemachal, it's unclear, is this the wedding party? Is this a party relating to the wedding, but maybe the next night, like a Sheva Brachot? Anyway, the party is the next night that he gets invited. Amarle Bar Kapara the Rebbe. Bar Kapara says to Rebbe. So now after this whole thing, Rebbe didn't want to invite him. And then in the end, he invites him. And then he says, don't make me laugh. And then he makes him laugh. And then Bar Kapara shows up to this party again, whether it's another one or the same one, it doesn't make so much of a difference. He shows up to this party. Amrle Bar Kapara the Rebbe. My Toeva starts to talk Torah with him. But what kind of Torah? He starts to quote, and if you started off with the, you started up with the daughter of Rebbe, he starts to quote verses from the Forbidden Relations, Pesukim, okay? And he says, what is this word, toiva? It comes up in the Pesuk about homosexuality. So they did some despicable thing, to which he says, what is this word, toiva? What's the meaning of it? Call the Amrle Rebbe, the Hachin Hu Toeva. Now remember, we're sitting at a wedding. Okay, a wedding, this union between husband and wife. And he starts quoting verses from all the forbidden relations. And he says, what's the meaning of this word to'eva? It's despicable. So everything Rebbe says to explain to'eva, Bar Kapar knocks down. That's not it. That's not true. That's not this. And he raises questions with everything he says. Amarle, Persha'at. So Rebbe finally gives up. He says, okay, you explain it. To which Bar Kapar says, very chutzpedich, First, I want your wife to pour me a cup of wine. Pour, again, means limzog in those words was, you know, to fix, prepare the wine. I want her to bring me a cup of wine. Okay, first of all, Rebbe's wife was a, a noble woman. You know, she probably didn't prepare the wine in general. They had servants. But he wants her to prepare it. Atat Ramile. So she prepares the cup of wine and gives it to him. He says to Rebbe, before I tell you what this word means, Kum rikod li amalach. Dance before me and then I'll tell you. Okay, very humiliating, right? First, they're sitting at his wedding party for his son and then they already, right? And as you're saying, Debbie, it sounds like he had too much already, right? This definitely sounds like a scene in a pub, right? And that there's, you know, there's this drunkenness atmosphere. And, and I think Rebbe must have been somewhat intoxicated because he doesn't respond in the appropriate manner. Like if you're the Nasi, you put down your foot and say, no way, no how. And he doesn't do that, which is very surprising. So he says, you know, number one, have your wife bring me wine. She does. I want you to dance before me. And he does. So hachiyama rahmana, now he tells him what the pasuk means. Toeva, toe ataba. You've, you've missed the point or you, you know, you went the wrong way. Okay. So that's number one. Lekasachrina, for another cup of wine. He want another cup. How's he going to get another cup? Well, he does the same thing. He raises another question. Amrle my teva. This is in a verse about a woman having relations with an animal. And it says there, 
Isha lo ta'amod l'tnei behema l'rav'a, she shouldn't go before an animal to have relations with it. Tevel hu. So what's this word, tevel? Amar lei, kien yana kedma'a. So he said to him, like in the previous, try giving him explanations and bar kapar, knock them all down. Amar lei, evelie do omar lach. He says, do like what I said, meaning have your wife bring me a cup of wine and you dance before me. Aved, and Rebbe does it. Amar lei, tevel hu, tevlin yeshba, what, is it spicier? Is this any different having relations with an animal better than any other relations? In other words, why would you bother doing this with an animal if you can do it with a person, right? This is like, it's a question. Is it any better, tastier than, you know, like in a, um, than, than the others? So okay, this is clearly inappropriate talk, what's going on here. Amrle, and remember, okay, and this is important for the last one. Okay, it's in threes. Everything in the Gemara is always threes in stories. So there are going to be three questions. The third one is going to relate back to the daughter of Rebbe. Okay, remember, he originally started with the daughter of Rebbe. So then he says to Rebbe, what is Zima? So Zima comes up in a Pasuk. Don't desecrate your daughter. Right? Don't sleep with your daughter. So now here you have Rebbe. He started with his daughter, you know, and then he quotes this verse about his daughter. So I don't know if he's insinuating something, but he's clearly, you know, touching on some raw point. And Amarle, Avid ki in he did like the first one. Avid va'amarle zo mayhi. So he says, what this is, this, what is this? Like, what kind of craziness is this? That's what he explains. And that the whole story, right? It basically unfolds like all the others. You're saying to that it says that Rebbe asked the question. That seems very strange. Why would Rebbe ask the question? Give me a minute. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, Rebbe asked about that. I wonder why Re why would it would have switched then? It's interesting. Okay, so then uh, that would change it, but I don't know if that's the only interpretation because it seems to me strange they would flip all of a sudden. Um, let me see. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know why they say that. Okay, I see. Uh, okay, so let's let's go on. So now. It says here, Lo Yachil ben Elasal Mispa. At this point, probably because he touched on this issue of the daughter, Ben Elasa could not tolerate this anymore. Okay. So I'm just want to, I'm very curious what you just pointed out because I want to see if that's the only interpretation. But anyway, I'll try to do this while I'm teaching. Anyway, he says, um, one second. Yeah, so no, not, not everybody interprets it that way. And I find it's a strange portion to say that. I'm not sure why anyone would say that. I think it was clear that it, like in my reading, yeah, and the Shanstein, I see you're saying that it was Bar Kapara who asked. I think it makes a lot more sense that Ben Kapara asked it. And that's what kind of set off Ben al -Assad. Like you're talking about my wife here. You know, this has really gone too far. So anyway, what happens? Ben al basically gets very upset. Now, he would have expected Rebbe to get upset and to have stopped this. I mean, he clearly had the power to stop this. He was the Nasi, could have stopped it. Why he doesn't is a really good question. And anyway, what happens now is Ben al come v'nafik hu taman. He and his wife walk out of the party. Okay, this is, right, make a big scene and they're like, we're out of here. Okay, that's the end of the story. <laughs> Now, just as an aside, my Ben El Asa, they want to know what's, what do we know about Ben El Asa? Ditanya, as it says in the Brayta, lo lechinam pizer Ben El Asat ma'utav. He didn't throw his money about for no reason. Ela laharot bahen tisporet shal kohen gadol. Apparently people were commenting about this haircut that he had, the special unique haircut. And it seemed also, we're going to see in a minute, it was like a Roman type haircut. Well, they say it was to show people what the Kohen Gadol's haircut looked like, which is very interesting. The Kohen Gadol had some haircut that was like a Roman type haircut. There's a pasuk from, uh, from uh, Yechezkel. And it has to do with the Kohanim. It, they had, it seems from here they learned they had some special haircut. Tana Ke'em Lul It was like Lul Yanit. Kohen connects to um, some Roman. Uh, Julianus or something. My Lulianit, Amar of Yehuda Tisporet Yechidat. It was a very unique haircut, and he spent his money on this. Some people say he spent his money that he himself would have that haircut, so people would know what it looked like, or he spent his money learning how to give that haircut, so that I guess if the temple was rebuilt, he'd know how to do it. Hechidami, how does it look? If you're curious about this haircut, what does it look like? 
By the way, another reference to the head. And anyway, the head of the hairs touches on the root of the necks. Okay, it'd be like, you know, where this hair ends, the next one starts. Behind which is Porachal Kohen Gadol. And that was the Kohen Gadol apparently had a unique haircut. Okay, very strange story. What do we do with this and what's going on? And what are other stories we know about Rebbe and Bar Kapara? So first of all, there's another story that was saw Moe Katan, which was about um, Rebbe, Rebbe's son, Rabbi Shimon Berebi, the one whose wedding party this is, is sitting learning with Bar Kapara. And they have a question. And Rebbe says, let me go ask my father. Uh, Rabbi Shimon says, let me go ask my father. And Rebbe says, uh, I'm sorry, I keep confusing who's. Rabbi Shimon Berebi says, let me go ask my father. And then, sorry, I'm just going to find it inside. And then um, Bar Kapara says to him, Rebbe Omer like, what do you think your father has to say about this at all? Again, very disrespectful. Halach Bamar Laviv. And then he told his father what Bar Kapara had said. He peed Rebbe. Rebbe gets upset. And then Bar Kapara comes in front of him and he says, I don't even know who you are. In a version of the Rishami, not only does it say, but a version of a different story in the Rishami also says that not only do I not know you, but Yada Bar Kapara realized that he was never going to become a rabbi. Like he was never going to get smicha in the time of Rebbe. Like there was no way. His, he was doomed at this point. And also in the Bavli story, it says he basically, he put himself into excommunication because he realized Rebbe was so upset with him. There it's interesting. He realizes that he crosses a line. Here he clearly doesn't realize that he crossed any line. Now, again, what do we do with this story? First of all, it's coming in the, in the context of this very, a lot of wealth. And it's basically coming and saying that Wealth, right? We started with these stories yesterday of the rabbis who were happy with very little. And this seems to be somewhat of a critique on Rebbe. It's also a critique on Bar Kapara, but it's also a critique on Rebbe. It was showing that Rebbe wasn't loved by all the people and people have what to say about him. They were critical of him of various things. Rebbe Chia was critical of him of other things. And, you know, they were critical of him. Uh, Bar Kapara was critical of the wealth and all that, which comes up in the sugya about, you know, it's interesting because what does your neder include? And neder goes by Lashon B'nai Adam. And then, you know, the question is, which B'nai Adam? And, you know, there might be some wealthy people, but we go by the Amcha and what the, the general people are doing. And again, it's, you know, maybe come down from your high seat and see who the people are. We already know Rabban Gamliel, who was from the family, right? Rebbe is descended from him, also had this issue. He didn't understand the poverty of all the people. So maybe Bar Kapara did it in a bit of an extreme manner. And maybe it was inappropriate, you know, the way he did it. But on the other hand, he was trying to make a point. Um, you know, Bar Kapara himself has a lot of issues and he's doing things in a very inappropriate manner and to start talking about forbidden relations in the middle of his son's wedding party is quite inappropriate. Um, and it's interesting that Ben El Asa, you know, leaves and, and Rebbe doesn't leave. And why doesn't Rebbe leave? You know, maybe he's in a precarious place. You know, the son-in-law can make a, a statement and, and notice the story ends at that point. Like Bar Kapara was quiet at that point and he succeeded in getting him to stop. Uh, okay, anyway, I was trying to think of his name. Um, it has the words Asa in it, which is Asiya, like he was a doer. It's interesting, right? He wasn't a Lamdan, but he he had his wits about him and he and he left. Uh, okay, so a lot of thoughts about this. Also interesting, you know, wedding of his son. We had the whole wedding of the son with the Beit Koron story not so long ago. And also, um, okay, so, and again, back to what I said yesterday about this issue of wealth is very important in the lane because the whole focus is on the money things, right? And, and the rabbis are trying to say, don't make these vows. And it's not all about money. And, you know, I think that's also possibly a, a message here. Okay, getting back to the Gemara and our sugi. So we had two things that are not included in Tavshil, this Beitza Tortima and Dalat Rimutza. My Dalat Rimutza. So what is this Dalat Rimutza? Amashmua Kara Karkuza. It was a very hard type of gourd. And I guess because of that, it wasn't really included because no people didn't eat it. As opposed to, you know, the, the delicacy, you know, maybe this just wasn't something a lot of people ate. Um, next, uh, but they say it's like an unripe gourd. So one says it's a type of gourd. The other one says it's how the gourd is cooked, that they would put it in these hot ashes in the ground and that's how they would cook it. So that's not considered a tough shield because it wasn't cooked in water in the typical way that water that uh, things are cooked. So ATV Ravina Ravashi. Ravina now brings a source that seems to go against Ravashi's reading. Rabbi Nehemia Omer. 
It's a lot. Okay, the background to this is we're talking about peline, crossbreeding different things. So now if you have different types of gourds, if you plant them near each other, is that considered mixing types because they're all gourds, so are gourds the same type? Or are they different types of gourds and maybe they're considered different types? So it depends which ones. So Dilat Aramit, he Dilat Amitzrit. The Aramean and the, and the Egyptian version of the gourds are similar enough that if you plant them together, it's not considered kilaim, mixing two different types. But kilaim ima yivanit, both of them are kilaim if you plant them with the Greek type, and kilaim ima rimutsa, or the rimutsa type. So this is a clear tiyuvta, it's a, it's a knockout to Ravashi, because Ravashi said it's the way it's cooked and it's not the type of gourd that it is. The first interpretation was it's a type of gourd that grows. So if it's a type, then it makes sense that it's in this source. If you say it's the way you cook it, that would have nothing to do with kilaim because kilaim are when things grow and not when they're cooked. So it would be irrelevant. Okay, Mishnah. Hanodil, we're now going to go through a slew of Mishnayot, a little Gemara on each one. This is going to be a very simple from here to the end of the doc about language used in, okay, if we started our Masechet with konam and all that, right? Now we're in the middle of language used in the type of foods that you're talking about, that you're forbidden. So you say things cooked in a kedera, which is a dish. Okay, the way I looked in Safra, he has pictures of this because we're going to compare kedera to an ilfas. Kedera looks to me like a casserole dish, narrow at the bottom, widens and then closes, you know, narrower at the top again. And uh, an ilfas, which we're going to see soon, is a pot, which like a pot you would make soup in, which you could also fry in. Okay, so it's a much more, has a lot more uses than a kedera. So if you say ma'asek kedera, okay, so first we're not going to get into kedera and ilfas yet, I just want to tell you what a kedera was, then ena sorela mi It must be something that you cooked up in this casserole pot where there was water in it and it boiled up. Amar konam hayored l'kedera, but if you say so ma'asek kedera, it's only specifically this ritachta, okay? We saw already this word before, it wasn't so clear what exactly it means, but it's something more specific. If you say konam hayored l'kedera, we're now going to have this with many different things. There's a difference between the item itself and then anything that goes into, okay? Anything that goes into a kedera, shani, right? Hayore the kedera shani toem, that I will taste. By the way, in all these mishnayot, the first one's going to be more like uh, a specific thing. The second one is going to be more general in two ways. And there's a machlok about what's the issue here that's the most important thing. Is it just that it's not specific? Like, is less specific than a ma'asek dera, something made in a dera is different than anything that goes into a pot or a, a, a dish. Or is it the word shani to'em that I will taste? Taste sounds like anything kind of included. Okay. Asur v'cholanasek dera. So in that case, it's already anything that goes into a dera. It doesn't have to be only things that were boiled up for a long time or something like that. Tan. Now we have another bright. No dermina yored lektera. If you say anything that goes into a ktera, asur bi yored le ilfas. That would include things that go in this soup pot type thing. Okay, why? Because things would often first be cooked in this casserole dish and then moved into either to warm up or to finish the cooking process into this pot. Shekfar yarad lektera, konem she yored le ilfas. And that's often you would first put in the Ktera and then you'll put in the Ilfas. So something that goes in the Ilfas probably was already in the Ktera before. Mina yored le Ilfas, but if you say from the Ilfas, mutar bi yored le Ktera. Not everything that went in the Ktera went in Ilfas. So therefore, if you said Ilfas, it's only things that went in the Ilfas and not things that were in the Ktera only. Mina na se Ktera, mutar bina se Ilfas. If you say something that was made in the Ktera, then again, something that was made in Ilfas would be included. But minanas, because the things that were in an ilfas already had gone into a first. Minanas said the ilfas, mutar b'nasa But if you say something made in an ilfas, not everything that was made in a goes in the ilfas. Hanodir minayoreh l'tanur. If you say, again, we're going to be more specific, something that goes down into the oven. Ain't a sore ele, but pot. Mainly what goes in the oven is bread. Okay, because that's what they would put it. Remember, they would put it on the sides of the oven. If you say any maaset tanur will be forbidden to me, asur b'cholanas in the tanur. That's a more general, and then you'll be forbidden to anything that ever goes into an oven. New mission. Mina kavush. Okay, we're now on Amabet. Okay, we're, we're just going to move on. This is all the same type of idea. 
min hakavush and so ela min hakavush shel yerek. You say from the pickled item, you must mean vegetables that are pickled, because that's you know again the this thing seems here to be more than masek derive, and it's very specific. Ha the okay the definite article the pickled item would be only vegetable. Kavush anitoem again one of two possibilities either because it doesn't say ha kavush the pickled item it just says pickled items generally or because you use the word shani toem that i taste which sounds like again general asurbakhalak fushi then anything that's pickled you can't eat even if it's not just a vegetable min hashaluk if you say from the cooked okay now this is a type of cooking we talked about the other day that generally means something very cooked here it seems to mean partially cooked ein asur ela min hashaluk shel basar Okay, it's only shaluk of basar because basar was something that they ate partially cooked. There's a debate about this. And in fact, the early texts of the Mishnah actually say yerek, which makes a lot more sense because in the Gemara, when they talk about shalukim, they often talk about yerakot shalukim. The main time you see shaluk is by uh, vegetables. So although you do see shaluk, as I said, in, in the Pesach, that we don't eat the meat this tonight, shaluk. So it's unclear exactly um, which one it is. Also, the Yerakot usually mean very well cooked. So maybe this use of shaluk with meat would mean partially cooked and then it would have to go with meat. Anyway, unclear. Shaluk shani to'em asur b'chol shlukim. But if you say again, without the hayidiyah, or because you said the word shani to'em that I taste, then you're forbidden to any sort of cooked item, not just meat or not just vegetables. Gemara. Amr le rav acha bereid rav avi le rav ashi. Amr le dikha what about di? Di means she, that. That is pickled. That is. Now, is that including a definite article or not? Right? Is that specific? Like that is pickled means, right? That this is pickled, you know, something more specific. Does it include that? Or is it more general, like shaluk or kavush? So they don't know. Tibai. We're left with a teku. Right, which normally we say teku in the Nidharam. We've talked about this many times. The language in Nidharam is a little bit different. The whole Masechet is written with a bit of a different, in a different language. So Tibai is used instead of teku. No Mishnah. Minat sali, eno asur ele minat sali shal basal, tivrei Rabbi Yehuda. Sali shani to'em asur b'chol atzluyim. If you say from the roasted item, then it's only roasted meat. Because what's the roasted item? It's usually meat is what you roast. That's tivrei Rabbi Yehuda. Salish ani toem asur b'chol atzluyim. It's interesting they say it's Rabbi Yehuda because everyone seems to nobody seems to really disagree. If you say roasted, that I will taste, then it includes any kind of roasted item. Minam aliach. If you say from the salted item, salting here we don't mean just you put some salt on it, but we like when you salt meat or salt fish, it's a different kind of thing. And asur elah maliach shal dag. The most common salted was fish. But if you say it again, generally, then anything salted. Dag dagim shani toem. This has many different interpretations. I'll go with the simple that you're saying both dag and dagim. Now, dagim is plural. That means you're probably talking about small fish. If you say dag, one fish, you're obviously not talking about teeny fish. You're all talking about one big fish. So if you say both languages, dag dagim, asur behen ben gedolim, ben tanim, ben meluchim, ben tfalim. So this includes everything. Big and small, salted, not salted, raw or cooked, everything is included. Umutar, but what is not included? Bitari trufa, which is chopped up fish into little pieces. If you say dag dagim, you're not really referring to a chopped up fish dish. And bitsir, and then the tsir, which is the brine. And you should add here bimorayus, which is the gravy from the fish. Hanoder, because those don't have fish in them, right? It's just the brine or the or the, the uh, gravy. Hanoder minat sachana. Okay, sachana was a dish that seemed to have big pieces of fish and little pieces of fish. So if you say sachana, asur b'tari trufa. Tari trufa, which is also cut up pieces, is included in the word sachana, but mutar b'tzir b'murayus, which again doesn't really have fish pieces in it. Hanoder mitari trufa, you say tari trufa, which is this cut up, chopped up stuff, asur b'tzir b'murayus, because that's more, the, the word sachana is more big fish and also chopped up. That already is too far distance from the tzir and the, and the, and the murayus. But if you say chopped up, which included a lot of oil and the fish, you know, the brine and the gravy and the fish, 
Therefore, it includes also the gravy and the marais. Although I think there's some people who have the nusach that it doesn't include it. I think, uh, yeah, some people say it's mutal. Okay, so there's two different ways of reading this. Again, there's a lot of differences of girsa, oh, which probably is affected by, again, when whoever was copying the manuscript also used their head and what they knew, knew of and sometimes might, you know, like the use of words again changes over time. So it could be that's why there's mistakes here in terms of people corrected at thinking what they thought was right. Tanya, new brighta. Okay, so the Gemara starts off now on this Mishnah with the brights. It's going to be very similar, although depending on how you understood that Dag Dagim, I will tell you some people think that, that our Tanda disagrees with this. Okay, but that would have to be a different interpretation than we used. Tanya Rabbi Shem ben Elazar, Dag Shani To'em, if you say Dag, Asur Bigdolim and Mutar Bigtanim. That's what we said before. Dag is the big fish, so you'd be permitted for little fish. Daga Shani To'em, if you use the word Daga, Asur Bigtanim and Mutar Bigdolim. Daga, now he's using a different word than the Mishnah. The Mishnah used Dag Dagim. He's saying daga means small fish. Dag daga shani to him, if you use them both, asur bein big dolim bein big which sounded just like our Mishnah, basically, except instead of dagim, he said daga. Okay, was the word. But again, like I said, there is, I will just tell you, there is a different way of reading our Mishnah, and then he would actually disagree. Amar le Rav Papa Labai. Mi maite dag shani to him gadol hu. Why do you think dag means gadol? What's the best proof? Huh. Where do we see fish in the most blatant place in the Torah, in the Tanakh? In Sefer Yona. What does it say? A dog, right? A dog gadol. So what do you see here? Dog is a gadol. So the dog gadol here. To which they say, but this is part of the question. Rav Papa says, Tabaya, wait a minute. Are you saying because it says dog gadol swallowed Yona, that dog is gadol and daga is katana? But wait. Yona cried out to God and prayed to him from in the midst of the daga. It calls that same fish a dog and a daga. So you can't say all of a sudden daga is small. So the Gemara says, Halukasha, Dilma Palte Dagadol, Bali Dagatan. Never know if you heard this interpretation of Yona. He was swallowed by the big fish. In the meantime, the big fish spit him out. He was then swallowed up by a smaller fish. And that's the daga in which he's in when he prays. He's in the small fish. And then that works perfectly. Ella, they say, okay, fine. Let's say that's what it means. Okay, I'm not convinced, but let's say. But Ella, I have a better pasuk. Go back to Makat Dam, right? The plague of blood. What happened? The fish that were in the Yaor died. The Daga. Now, you're going to say, what? From, from the blood, the plague of blood, only the little fish died and not the big fish. That guy, of course, means big fish. You can't say, you know, the plague of blood distinguished between the big fish and the little fish. The word daga clearly means big or small, but what's the bottom line? Punchline always. We don't prove things from Tanakh language. Nowadays, and in their time, People use the word daga to mean small fish and dagim to mean big fish uh, or dag to mean big fish. And therefore, not dagim, sorry, my mistake, dag to mean big fish. Here, we're not talking about dagim at all. Dag means big, daga means small, and it doesn't matter what the Tanakh called them, Torah called them, we go by the way people use it on the street because, again, we're talking about vows, vows that people made. They're using language that's used in daily life. Hanodir minat sachana. So we had this sachana, which meant some mix of big and small fish. What if you said tzichin, which was some form of tzachana? Now, what they want to know here is, is tzichin, how is tzichin used? Is it a more specific type or is it a more general type? Okay, will it include the morayas and the brine and all, right? The brine and the and the, the tzir and the morayas? Or will it not include, right? Will it include more things, less things? Well, tibai, we don't know the answer to that question. Okay, we'll finish off with the beginning of our next Mishnah. Hanoder menachalav mutar bekom. If you say halav, then you're permitted to eat the whey, right? When you make the cheese from the, the milk, there's this liquid called whey. That is not included in milk. But Rabbi Yossi, Yossi, Rabbi Yossi says, no, the, the whey comes from the milk. It's part of the milk. So yes, it would be included in milk. However, they all agree that minakom, if you say from whey, mutar halav. Well, when you say whey, you certainly don't mean milk. So then you'd be permitted to drink milk. You say, I won't eat uh, cheese. Whether it's salted cheese or not salted cheese. If you 
say I won't eat meat, you're allowed to eat gravy of meat and you're allowed to eat small pieces of meat like the ones that get stuck on the sides of the of the pot, you know, the scrapings, you can eat that. For Rabbi Yehuda, Oser, but Rabbi Yehuda doesn't allow this. He doesn't think that that's permitted. And with that, we will stop for today. We'll start tomorrow with a ma'aseh, with Rabbi Tarfon, and we'll get there in tomorrow's stuff. So lots of things to think about. Again, probably worth going back to the story of Rabbi Yochan Ava, Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, and Bar Kapara, trying to see what other sources exist about it. By the way, um, Rabbi Benny Lau has a book called Chachamim, so I'll show you. And it's also translated into English by Alana Kershan. So there he has a whole section on Rabbi, uh, Rabbi and Bar Kapara. And actually the section before, it's, it's if you want a, a good, good reading, the section before is about, I'll tell you what it's entitled. Um, where is it? I lost it. Here. Ben Mishnah, the bright Ben Rabbi the Rabbi Chia. Right, so there's a thing about actually it's two chapters before about the differences between Rebbe and Rabbi Thea, you know, and the differences there, and then the differences between Rebbe and Bar Kapara. Like he had, you know, people had issues with him in different planes. So this was on one plane, and that was Rabbi Thea had differences with him on a different, uh, different area. You know, that's why we ended up with the Tosefta of Rabbi Thea and the Mishnah of, of Rebbe. Anyway, it's a good book to know about, and uh, we'll end here for today. Have a great day, everyone.